I later on became national director for Arista Records uh, and for Def Jam Records. Um, I also uh, uh, was based out of Los Angeles for three years as the uh, vice president of urban promotion for DreamWorks Records. And uh, as I said, I'm currently the uh, senior national director at Epic. And, uh, All right, thank you very, very much, Mr. Hartfield. Mr. Pugh. How are you? And once again, a pleasure, um, and thank you for, for having me here. My name is Benny Pugh. I'm a tenured music executive, started my career in 1990 as an intern at Motown Records. Realized uh, as a local promoter and a college promoter, which was my first entry point, um, that I fell in with the business and fell in love with the business of music, which uh, led me to, on the path of creating um, a career um, in this great business of art. Um, 1990, I was at Motown, um, started uh, in, as, a, as a regional director of promotions, then moved on to uh, Perspective Records, where I was the national director of marketing and, and lifestyle promotions. Um, then from there, I went to Def Jam Records from, <clears throat> I'm sorry, MCA, from 1996 to 2003 as the senior vice president of uh, promotions and worked, um, you know, some various artists, uh, Casey and Jojo, Mary J. Blige, her four albums after the uh, uh, 411, uh, the Guy Reunion album, which I was super excited about being a part of that. And you know, that great wedding song, <clears throat> All My Life with uh, Kay and, and Joe. Moved from there, came to Def Jam in 2003 um, as the SVP and had an amazing run um, uh, at the label from 2003 to 2011, where um, such artists such as Rihanna was, was discovered, uh, Justin Bieber was discovered, um, Jeezy, Rick Ross, um, Jay's Black Album, Mariah Carey's uh, Emancipation of Mimi, being a part of all the marketing promotions um, uh, uh, at that particular time at the label. Moved on from there to Epic Records, um, where I signed Future, um, Yo Gotti, uh, Cash Out, which were which were prominent um, at the point. Also, the label at that in at that particular time brought in <clears throat> Ter um, Travis Scott, um, French Montana, and a uh, host whole host of of artists outside of R&B, uh, Ma uh, Megan Taylor and. Um, and uh, to name of to name a few, left there um, as the executive vice president of the label, and um, took on the uh, the uh, task of moving on to Rock Nation, where I created uh, a distribution funnel for them and put out about eighteen releases um, off of off of their uh, their label as well, and decided that at this point I wanted to move forward in the music business and get a slither of of uh, what the business has to offer. Being a part of music for 30 years, looked at maybe everything that I touched or been a part of may have uh, materialized to over a billion dollars in revenue for the company. And I thought about it and said, you know what? I had to make 10% of that for myself, right? So moving forward with my, with, uh, my contact list and, and um, all of the knowledge that I had, decided to step out on my own and uh, create a diverse media which is, um, you know, a full functioning label as well as distribution model that I currently um, own, operate, and a part of daily. Absolutely phenomenal, both of you. Um, I, I think that the audience will gain a lot from hearing more from you. So let me ask this question. Um, with the ever-changing landscape of of music and the the digital world as we're living in, um, how would you describe the role of today's record label? And either one of you can can go first. Well, um, I mean, the function of the label it's it's kind of symbiotic with the times. And um, what do I mean by that? Um, depending on what the technology is labels will morph into and be a part of that because culture is very important um, in music, right? That's, that's really what a driving force is 
in, in record companies. So companies are always self-evolving and being current, one, in leading culture and being a part of, of what's, what's actually um, available in the marketplace. So um, what's really key right now is, is making sure that you're staying a part of what's active um, from a technological standpoint um, in music in order to be competitive. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I would agree. Uh, definitely, you know, Benny hit that right on the head. Um, you know, uh, in the the newer aspects definitely hit the technology, but uh, also still in the classic sense of the label, uh, discovering, uh, nurturing, and investing, you know, in new talent and, and bringing what's next. That's awesome. Um, so in keeping with that same discussion, um, you hear a lot about how streaming has had a negative impact, at least initially on how the business model for a conventional record label um, look like. Um, how would you guys respond to that? I don't think it's had a negative effect. Um, I think it's uh, kind of what Benny hit on with the with the culture. Uh, the label is going to always be on the pulse of the culture. So whatever changes happen digitally, uh, the labels are going to keep right up with it. Uh, I mean, there might have been a slight lag 15 years ago uh, when technology changed to digital. Uh, but, you know, with streaming, uh, I feel like the transition of the labels has been seamless. The, the, uh, the labels have, uh, you know, ridden that wave all the way through. Um, and the traditional aspects of what the label do have remained too. So it's been more of the foundation of what was there and then embracing what's new and, and keeping up with the times. I mean, the uh, uh, finding the talent, developing the talent, uh, and plugging it into the new technology is, is, is going to always be a part of the basic model of, of the labels. So with that, I think, you know, most of the labels are enjoying uh, more success now than ever. You know, the business is definitely growing. And you also have to think, right, is all of us as um, music listeners, aficionados, artists, talent, just think about this. Music in the last year, the business of music has made more money probably collectively than all of the years prior, right? Universal made $8.9 billion in stream, you know, in music revenue, right? Uh, I think Sony was 7.9 and Warner's went public, right? So when you think about the, the labels um, as a whole, I mean, you can't cry for the labels. I think what also has happened as well is that the independent person has now has a vehicle on monetizing without the label. Like before there was just, you know, either you make it at a label or you can't make it at all, right? The gatekeeper effect. And, and now as an independent label such as myself or other, the millions of people out there that are looking on getting into the business, you actually can, right? Um, and the only thing that's going to stand away in your talent, because you can go straight to the distributor and you can go straight to the customer. Right. And what the label actually allows you to do is put um, combustion on your project faster than you may be able to do on your own. But over time, if you have talent, you may you you're potentially putting yourself in the best position to be successful with or without a label, which didn't exist before. So um, I think it's a win win. It's a win-win for both, right? As an independent and as a label, right? Ideally, um, depending on what your model and what it is that you expect and what you want. So, Mr. Pugh, you make some very good points. So would you say that the do-it-yourself model actually serves an artist best now than, than trying to get that ultimate coveted record deal? Well, it's um, it's 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 a multi- it's a multi-tiered answer in that, right? A do-it-yourself is always 
exist as well. Independent rock acts, right? So they played for years on the road and, you know, the Chitlin circuit for artists is just, it's just been um, called something different, right? It's DIY yourself, right? We haven't, in the past, it wasn't um, identified that way, right? And what it is, is just a means of, you know, exploiting your talent, right? So um, what you are able to do now, which was eliminated in the past, is go directly to the consumer, which in the old brick and mortar perspective, you had to go through an independent distributor in order to get your music placed in a store, which now you can actually go to the store yourself. And ultimately with your art, it's a matter of exposing it and having all of the mechanisms and vehicles, right? So ideally, it depends on where you want to be. Like if you think about artists of like NBA Youngboy, right? He's just um, uh, an amazing case study of being independent, right? On He doesn't care about the big billboards or he doesn't billboard number ones or, or aspects. He generates tens of millions of dollars a year being indie, right? So you don't get the public accolades, you might not get, you know, the chart position, you might not get the TV show, but if you're in the business for making money, right, the business of music with your art, you're going to make money. Hence, there are artists that, you know, just have um, enough talent or very superstar talent, but you can't figure it out on your own, right? You, everyone can't be DIY, right? Everyone just can't do it. And if you have enough talent to, to expose yourself, right, to catch the attention of, of a major that can take you beyond, why not do that either? So the marketplace is really conducive for whatever works best for you as an artist or as an independent label. So I think those decisions are really up to the individual, individual and the freedom now to pursue which avenues are probably the best of what the current environment offers. Mr. Hartfield, would you weigh in on that? Uh, I mean, I definitely think um, the the DIY model is is much tighter. It's uh, it's always been there. Uh, you had a, independent distributors, uh, even in like Gonzalez, Louisiana, or Houston, or Dallas. You had independent distributors that would uh, would distribute indie artists and indie labels and. And, and give them a chance. And, and now with the aggregators and being able to go directly to the customer and, and directly to digital distribution, it's definitely a unique opportunity. Um, uh, it's always, uh, I, I think it's, it's about expectation. It's about your expectation and, and how much work you're willing to put in on the front end. But if you use the DIY model uh, it gives you an idea of what the value uh, of your product is. You know, is there a demand for this? Uh, you know, is radio interested? Are fans interested? Will people actually take their money and, and, and you know, purchase merchandise? Uh, which can give you a better understanding or, or better negotiating power even when you walk into a situation where you're uh, uh, looking at being signed by a major label. Uh, so it, it's definitely a, a, a better opportunity at D, uh, DIY now than they've ever been. So with that understanding, um, I have seen where there are some acts that go viral. The numbers look crazy. It's, it's just everyone's excited about it. Then they sign a deal. It goes into a building. And for some reason, beyond that particular record that had all the crazy numbers, the artist never really breaks. You know, you can't get a record to, to pop. Um, so that being said, do you guys think that there's some, some puffery to how the digital side works when you're doing it on your own that prevents you from really being able to become that traditional star? What do you think? Stars, stars are different than hits. Okay. Right? Like if... Um, you know, you, we see the stars, right? And, and we forget about the hits in, in the scenario that you may say. And think about it, one hit wonders have always just really been that. Um, just think about when it just, when the, when the artist or the music actually comes in your sphere 
is when you actually then become uh, reckon it becomes recognizable to you, right? And the more of the audience that you you will you're able to garner will dictate you know your success because um, I think what we have we've forgotten sometimes in this because of the fast pace of the internet is just because you it's 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 in your face doesn't mean that it's new right like um if in a traditional model right at a record company or even if you look at the artists who have staying power there are very few artists right even in the current day that become popular that haven't been around for two or three years right right they um it, it, it they put in the time right for that flint for that spark when, when the spark hits they've already came to the party with with a base right and that goes back to what we were talking about in the last question it's you know how it works so a lot of the you know the diy people who have um actually garnered um, a base of sorts when life takes on that life moment happens for them they've already have infrastructure right and the ones that are just truly a phenomenon, TikTok or, you know, any kind of life moment tragedy or, or uh, uh, upside emotional um, eu euphoric moment that might happen or celebrity doing those things don't make you a star. You know, you might just, you have a moment. So that moment is just different than, you know, uh, somebody uh, with a great promotion staff running your record up back up in the 80s and you go like, well, whatever happened with Millie Bernilli or any of those, you know, we can go through the countless number of people who were in the, you know, uh, cassette, right, CD, <laughs> right, space that didn't last either. So I think it's just, you know, it's just indicative of the times. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree. Um, you know, some people, their product, is is himself it's the artist and that's what you uh, as you're introduced to the artist and you're introduced to their music um it's really about the artist and their creativity and their story and then others uh it is just a moment it's just a, a single it's just a song it's a record um you see it on tiktok sometimes it's not even so much the record it's a dance uh, or a challenge now. And um, it, that takes off for that moment. And then there may not be any material uh, or wherewithal uh, with the follow through on that. Uh, you know, um, a lot of times uh, artists may be huge on uh, the internet or the platforms. And then once they get out and connect the dots and uh, they can't go on their true fans. And um, so I think it's different uh, with every artist, with every song, and uh, it's not a one size fits all. That's great. So let's go back to um, Mr. Pugh. You, you were saying that you, um, you know, with this great career you've had, you decided to hang your own shingle and for the audience, um, you know, built up of uh, a lot of student um, lawyers um, trying to figure out what the next move is for, for themselves. I'd like to ask you what type of advice, um, probably general business advice, would you give a person that's, that's trying to hang their own shingle or, or basically a startup label? You know, what would you tell that owner? <laughs> Um, get a great lawyer, <laughs> right? Um, and I think what's really amazing about about this um, opportunity and this conversation is, I mean, that's a great point, right? And knowing where you fit in um, in this in this game of music, right? If if and it's really about a team and and understanding everyone's aspect, right? I'm I'm a business creator quasi information understanding person, but I'm not a lawyer. So what's important for me in, in not only just finding talent is also finding new ways to construct deals that are competitive and important for each individual that I deal with, right? Because 
ideally it's about monetization, right? And, and what I put in, fairness is always the best avenue, right? And I think if we've not learned anything over the years is being transparent, right? Like um, I'm the first to tell um, any of my artists when we start is get your own lawyer. I'll give you four or five different people that you can pick from if you know, if you don't know any, but I don't want any of that, right? I want you to make the best choices for you, right? I have no problem in having discussions about the deals and why I'm taking what I'm taking, right? And if it doesn't work for you, then that's fine. Maybe we don't need to do business, but um, I, I believe in how you start is how you'll finish, right? And um, what I'm bringing to the party is equal and important is your talent that you bring um, as well. So I would recommend to anyone, right? Uh, executive, attorney, um, artist is, is transparency, right? And, and no games, right? Just be straightforward in the beginning. We'll give you a long lasting relationship in the end. Mr. Hartfield, you want to weigh yeah, in? I mean, yeah, uh, definitely, you know, and, and it's a question you get all the time when you see people and people like, well, you know, I got a label, I'm starting a label. And I think it means, it means something to, um, something different to a lot of different people. Uh, uh, Benny's definitely a unique uh, case study because he's got 30 years of experience in the business and starting a label. Uh, the, the average person that walks up to me and says, hey man, I got a label. It was an idea three months ago. <laughs> and they got, they, they got an artist and they took them to the studio and they got a demo and now they say, hey, I got a record label. And um, I think one of the most important things which Benny hit on was have a team. Uh, you can't have a label if you don't have a team. If it's you and the artist and the demo, you probably got a production company uh, or maybe you're a manager, but you're not a record label. You're not a label if you're not monetizing music um, and, and, and you don't have anything, you, you're not a label and, hey, is this available on Amazon? Oh, but no, I haven't put anything up for sale yet. You, you're, not a, you're not a label. Uh, you aspire to be a label. And I think on that quest, you need to build a team um, and get as much information as possible. You know, do the due diligence. I mean, if, if you open any other kind of business there's certain background you're gonna do. If you open a restaurant, if you open a car wash, you're gonna go get books and you're gonna go hire an attorney that may have a background in that business. You're gonna seek advice from uh, professionals in that business. So you can have a business plan uh, that you know guarantee you as much as it can, an opportunity to have success. And so my advice is uh, be patient, do your homework and seek out professional advice and, and move forward from there at the, at the rudimentary level of someone just starting a label. Now, as you talk about this here, I'm reminded of something and typically I don't get personal, but I have to tell this story. So there was a time we were sitting at, at uh, dinner and um, I had a, a colleague with me and um, uh, Mr. Hartfield asked him, so what do you do? He's like, yeah, I, I own a record label. And uh, Mr. Hartfield said, how many records have you sold? And, and the guy kind of leaned back in his chair. He said, uh, none. And so uh, Mr. Hartfield said, well, you don't have a record label. And I tell that story because it's, it's something that stayed with me. And it, it really helped me to help other people to understand that it's a business and you have to focus on, on the business side of things. Um, definitely understand that you need a team, but so many times, you know, people look at what they see on TV and they think as soon as you have a song, an artist, a demo, automatically you are a label. So that's good that you still have that, um, that viewpoint. Um, so let's move to, another piece of personal uh, um, history. I want you guys to talk about something that you directly learned from one of your uh, recording artists, because there's been so many, 
uh, that, that you learned from them and you decided to adopt as part of your own individual strategy and your business approach? Wow. Um, I, would, I would have to lump the best, right? They all share something that's consistent. And I didn't realize the level of what performance is and, and realizing on how I had to intensify my game. So working with some of the greats like um, Jay-Z, Raya, Future, Lionel Richie, right? And why I name those is their worth ethic was insane, right? Like some, some people fall into success. Some people drive themselves to success. And the talent is only part because their business acumen was at the same level or bar far even greater on why they are who they are and the success that they are. And you see them as artists, but you don't see the behind, right? And I'll never forget um, when I first started at Def Jam, had an interview with, uh, with um, uh, Power 105 for Jay-Z. And uh, the interview was at seven o'clock. And I remember, I was like, you know what? Let me just get there at six o'clock because I wanted to make sure everything was in great, you know, um, once he got there, things would be okay. Um, work out all the bugs if they need be, you know, prep. He pulled up at 6.15. And this is a rapper, right? Like you just think of rappers, right? Pulled up at 6.15 to be there for seven o'clock which showed there are very few artists that come on time, but there are very few artists, and this is going back decades, that show up almost an hour early for an interview at 7 a.m. in the morning, right? So not only just is a great talent, you'd have to say like, well, if a guy's like this on his business, right? If the, once the talent and the business connect, you can't be anything else but that. Um, future realizing how he was nonstop uh, committed to his craft, like outside of just going into the studio, right, being with his family, all he did was create, right, and stay focused on each each step of execution and executing, getting music out to out to, to his fan base and to his audience, and also corralling and putting together an enormous and an incredible team um, to, to manage his business. So what I realized um, and what I currently still realize is how to stay intact and also always continue to push yourself. You know, saying you're, you're great is one thing, right? Being great is something totally different and it's a whole nother level. You go beyond, right? It's all of those classic stories we hear about, you know, that extra gear or, or people going, get, be, being outside, you know, athletes being outside of themselves in the moment. But that's every day for people who work and perform at a, at a high level. And not forgetting that is what I've learned from some of the great artists is, there's never a moment to stop, but there's also a balance for you to live your life. Yeah, I, I think I'm the same way. I think, I, I don't know if there's one particular thing from one particular artist, uh, but a combination of, you know, the more successful artists and, uh, you know, I definitely work closely being based out of the South with a lot of the Southern artists, uh, you know, T.I. and Rick Ross and GZ and Future. And, 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 you know, the common elements of just their dedication, their grind, their work, their hustle, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's real. You know, that hustle they talk about uh, is, is real. They're, they're nonstop. Um, the the work ethic, uh, the tenacity, uh, you know, learning the ability to take one step back and then move two steps forward. 
Um, you know, I think those are just the overall things you learn that give uh, to give artists longevity, and they can also give you longevity as 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 an executive. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's more you know what I've learned from from my experience with 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 the artists. You know, I I would think that that probably is um, a reciprocal thing because Ti was actually on earlier this morning and um, he was on with his team. His team did a lot of talking and and just kind of gave us insight on what it looks like to have seven different enterprises. And he was just then really getting back off of uh, traveling on a on a red eye. And he still had time or made time to participate in this. So um, it's a it's a testament to exactly what you guys are are talking about. So, Mr. Pugh, uh, you are responsible for uh, turning many music artists into household names. Uh, so thus, you understand success. But I think even more so, you understand failure as many more of them actually fail. So in your opinion, what attributes makes a successful recording artist, a manager, producer, or attorney in the music business? And is there some type of commonality that's amongst them that we need to understand today? I would, I would definitely have to echo um, my last response, but also just add a caveat. Um, business is one thing, but but, but your drive and motivation is, is something totally different, right? Um, what I realized in, in music is actually seeing the finish line, right? Like when you come to work every day, no matter what your craft or whatever you choose to do, you have to be focused on the finish, right? And you can't worry about the process as much as you do getting past the finish line, right? And, and I realized um, with with artists that that didn't make it to the finish line, they just ran out of gas and weren't really committed to what what the process was going to be for them to be successful. Right at the end of the day, who cares about how you had to run the race as long as you finished the race? And some people only wanted to um, along the way be there for the celebration. They didn't want to be there for the work. So. Um, in this business or any other business, you have to be committed, right? And you, there are going to be growing pains. There's going to be difficulties. And that's what networking is really, you know, um, important. What I realized in my career along the way was equally important having conversation with interns as well as um, chairmen, right? And saying hello and being prepared for any conversation at any level to, to learn. Right. And part of this game is only about learning. I keep young, fresh teams around me consistently. And I have my bank and reservoir of really knowledgeable, wise individuals. Right. That's the only way to keep it fluid for me to grow and help others and stay sharp on what's happening is is, is staying open. Right. And staying fresh, staying current and staying as knowledgeable as possible, right? And being committed, like the commitment is really what it's all about, is committed to your craft. And outside of that, hey, listen, a little luck, right? A little luck, putting yourself in the right position, right? And that comes along with the work, right? Going above and beyond, um, doing things you don't wanna do, right? Everything except for compromising your integrity, you're open to, right? So that's immersing yourself in the business because your talent then will connect with somebody that's going to move you to the next step. Wow. That's powerful. Absolutely powerful. Mr. Hartfield. So talk to us about how um, conventional or traditional promotion continues to thrive in this digital driven marketplace. And do you believe that social networking or, or digital media uh, will eventually cause traditional promotions to become totally obsolete. Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't think it'll. Yeah, I don't think it'll make it obsolete. I mean, the 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 parts of the puzzle, uh, you know, and and, and Benny kind of hit on that earlier when he was talking about the cassette tape, the CD. You know, we see the MP3. 
there's always going to be new technology and definitely the new technology needs to be embraced and, and exploited, um, you know, to, a, to its fullest. Uh, but I, I often get questions, people like, oh, well, you know, is, is radio over? Is, is, you know, uh, do artists still need to go out and do promo? Is that necessary now? And, you know, I'm, I'm a believer that there, it's always going to be a piece of the puzzle. Now, uh, will radio continue to be as big a piece as uh, the platforms? I, I don't know. Uh, but I tend to think that, uh, you know, music is a emotional experience. Uh, you look at one of the things during the COVID right now, uh, people are longing for interaction. They're missing shows and artists performing and uh, being able to, uh, you know, see their artists at clubs and venues and uh, hear them on their local radio stations. You know, some are doing, they're doing Zoom, but it's different when you know that that artist is in your market and he's telling you, hey, we're going to leave the station and we're going to be at this club tonight. Um, so um, I think, you know, online is definitely, uh, you know, the wave of now and the future, but you're going to always have to deal with offline as well when you're dealing with an emotional um, experience like music. Uh, people want to feel you. They want to text you as an artist. They want to see you. They want to take pictures with you. Um, so um, I, I don't see it becoming obsolete at all. That's great. That's great. Um, kind of sounds like to me, uh, what we do hasn't changed is how we do it has changed. And um, so let me go back to exactly. go back to Mr. Pugh. Um, so just tell us how do labels find talent today? Um, in other words, where should artists and aspiring music professionals concentrate their efforts in order to land inside of a building? Um, so I have a um, I have a ritual of 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 how I look for music, um, being the traditional means Apple Music, Spotify, um, you know SoundCloud, and uh, some of the things that I'm really excited about are actually still come to me from uh, word of mouth. You know people who still love music, still follow music and know someone who's really special. And then I'll search and see, oh, okay, you have some traction, right? So um, I think it's just making yourself available. Once again, you know, what's old is new again. And some things are still always gonna be consistent, right? It's how much you put in, you get out. And, and although you can, what we fail, people fail to realize is as an independent artist, each month, there may be, what is a 100, 120,000 songs that are uploaded. So now that you can put your music out, right? You're in the company of new music, right? Yo, 120,000 releases on all platforms, a billion releases, over a billion releases during the course of the year. Who hears that? Who sees that, right? So now you're just in the sea. You're a match floating in the sea, right? <laughs> At the end of the day, you might get discovered. You might, you might find your way. So network is really important. It goes back to, you know, um, how much you put in. Yeah, although you can record your house, it may behoove you to invest a little going in a studio every now and again, right? Just to meet an engineer or meet a producer who might turn you on to somebody else, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have to be active or proactive or even now with the Zoom aspect of it, you know, people are trading music, et cetera, et cetera. And people are still in studios now, even during the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. um, those who, you know, it's safe, safe recordings, right? But, you know, those who are serious about their craft are serious about their craft, even in these times, because music is what uplifts us and brings us through everything, right? Brought us, music brought us from Africa and, and the slave ships, right? To now we're in the pandemic and music and, and, and artists are, are moving us um, as well. So, you know, once again, just the basics. You wanna get in the building, stay to the basics, right? And let, and let 
and, and don't stop promoting, right? There is no bigger fan of you than you. Those are some great nuggets there. Um, so here's a quick scenario that I often see. Um, somebody's popular on their street, you know, um, their family members know them, a couple of homeboys know them, um, and, and they reach out to me and say, look, you know, he's hot. The first thing I do, I look at uh, the vitals. I see what the numbers look like. And more times than not, the numbers are abysmal. So as an as a executive, where you are, how important are the numbers? And do you feel like there may be too much importance placed on the numbers whereby really great artists are not getting an opportunity because we're, we're paying too much attention to the numbers? That's if the numbers matter to you. <laughs> I, I think the consumer now looking at numbers is absolutely crazy, right? Like if you went to art, like this isn't, you know, we're not, it's not super, super bowl picking boxes, right? Like, you know, this is talent in people's lives. And if you're into art, you're into art and it doesn't really doesn't matter when you're really into music. Um, I, my first artist I actually signed was from Jack as on D verse. She's from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, no numbers, uh, but she was very unique. Like, her sound was, she's a, she's a little African-American girl from fair skin, beautiful, intellectual, driven, uh, educated, but she has an incredible tone that no one else has. And it kind of emulates the sound of uh, Amy Winehouse, which is in, in modern era, right? And this is a little black girl sounding like a British, you, you understand? So it's, it's like, that's talent, right? And, and ultimately, for what I do and what labels do, we, you can always get to the numbers and, you know, numbers are relative, right? It's really what is success. Not, you know, the numbers are for whom, you know? Like you can't have new artists, um, a superstar artist can't have new artist numbers because now you're in a different, uh, a trajectory of your career, right? But as a new artist, you have your whole career to be whatever you want to be, and ultimately is really about sustainability, right? If if you're making money doing what you do, then it's a career. If, if if you're not making any money, then it's a hobby, right? So at some point, you figure out whether you're in a career as, or a hobby as an artist. But but you know the numbers um, really doesn't carry that much weight with pure talent right and depending on what your business model is right or you know you have to have the the commerce aspect of it but you also have to have the artist aspect of it um to be a successful business kind of like back to what we were talking about earlier right you want those one hit wonders that pay the bills right on some okay we made our year but you also want to make sure you sign Erica Badu or Beyonce or Rihanna or Drake, right? That are gonna keep your keep make your label credible as well as sustain throughout the times for decades. So finding that right balance is what's important as a label person. Mr. Hartfield, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Um Not, not really on that subject. I think, I think Benny hit, he hit all the points I would have hit on that one. So at this point, I will open it up to uh, the audience. I have a few questions here. So the first one is, uh, it's anonymous. Uh, do you find yourself proactive or reactive when dealing with clients? For example, uh, do you let the client drive the decisions or are you driving the artist to make the decisions? Well, with me, I'm, you know, I'm in a, 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 a structured label environment. So once the artist turns in the projects, then our various departments will take over and work with management. And it's, it's more of an exchange. But, uh, you know, I believe in almost every setting, the uh, artist is going to initiate uh, once you get to a certain level because, you know, the artist is creative 
So once they turn in the vision and the, and the project, then um, as far as my capacity, you work, you work with artists and management on what they've presented. Um, oftentimes, I hear um, people saying, hey, don't sign because they're going to try to control you, tell you what to do. Um, you guys have been in the business a long time. Do you find that um, the labels are really controlling everything or, or are they allowing more artists to be out front making the creative decisions? Well, you, you have to think of it right. Think of it differently. And this is a perfect um, a group of folks is you, you're only in control of what you negotiate. <laughs> right at the end of the day like they didn't take it from you you gave it right so ultimately that's the first step and that's what you know great representation matters because you can have carve outs on any and everything you want if if you're coming in and into the organization with 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 that weight right or what you choose you know my freedom giving this up isn't worth it for me so this deal in this place isn't for me. So, you know, that choice is, is always um, in, in the hands of the creator. And once again, back to, you know, the marketplace being ripe and viable to do it yourself, you can, but you can't take somebody's money and now we'll have your own rules. Like that, that doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> That's like a house guest telling you like, yo, nah, yo, I'm, I'm with the lights off at nine o'clock, right? You would feel like, what? Would you, how would you feel about that, right? You invite your people over and now they talking about, I go to sleep at nine, I don't want to hear nothing. You wouldn't do that, right? So, so you know, think about what, how you getting involved into the business. And, you know, you can't complain. You sign the paper. Great. Um, Rakeem Brown asked, uh, any recommendations uh, as a whole where a, uh, a law student after co completing law school should go to try to start their career um, in the music industry? Well, most of the major uh, distributors and labels have internships in the legal department. Um, and also you can seek out um, people in your area who've worked in entertainment law. And uh, that's also a good source to, um, uh, to get experience. Uh, it's definitely, uh, you know, as a lawyer, you, you come out and you know the law, but it's just like any field you go into, there's nuances that you're only gonna learn by being in the business, doing deals in the business, and working with somebody who's done deals in the business. So um, I, I think, you know, whether it's locally with someone who may have some experience, or whether you're in a, a, a Nashville, or Memphis, Atlanta, uh, LA, or New York, where there may be someone locally who's doing a lot of those deals, or uh, go through the the legal uh, departments uh, and get those uh, internships that they provide for legal students. Great. There's a, a question that asks, um, what skill sets uh, does a label look for in a music or entertainment lawyer? Uh, great knowledge of the law, right? Um, I mean, really think of it, um, it's, Music companies are no different than than any other business, right? Like you're you you want your experts to be experts at what they do. Um, just because you're at a music label doesn't mean you're gonna pick the next single on Artist X. That's not your role. That's not what what you came. You you're here because you love. This is a preferred business that you you choose to be in. But if you want to rise and move, then you need to be an expert at what you do. Right and staying current on all the new deals, staying current on on uh, how competitive competitive the environment is, and making sure that you're the best person um, uh, inside of the organization 
that's being recognized and in the position for growth predicated on your work, right? And that then um, uh, will will help you craft um, elevating inside of a music company, right? And doesn't mean that people are going to minimize your appreciation for music, but the the, the attorney is not what I'm looking for for the next signing, right? Or the attorney isn't who I'm looking for to validate the artwork, right? Although that may be your passion, you'll figure out how to work that in, but realize you're there to structure the best deals for the future of the company. Absolutely. Uh, I have one last question um, from Devetta Selma. Um, you could add, answer this if you want to. Uh, but she asked, um, as both panelists worked at Def Jam, I'm curious to know who they think will serve as the next Def Jam president. And is there urgency in filling that role? Uh, who will serve as, who do I think? I think it should be, I think it should be a woman. Not just for this gratuitous, you know, environment, right? Um, I think Def Jam is is was founded by two men, right? Um, the, the the lineage of it, right? Both in the wins and losses, have all been men, right? Um, and uh, I think for where Def Jam is now in its history, right? It's not the same. Um, from a musical standpoint, from an executive standpoint. And there's an opportunity now. I think it just needs to be um, pushed um, in something that's just non-traditional because Def Jam was disruptive and non-traditional. So why not now have an opportunity for um, it to be molded differently, but in the culture, right? Because there are women now who are equally um, immersed in the culture is men and they've done everything else, right? In every every other kind of leadership, except for that. So that's what I would think would be the best um, opportunity if I was um, making that choice. I have one alibi um, and this is for Mr. Hartfield. Um, since we've been talking about independence, uh, is there a solution for independents to gain uh, access to major label type promotion results? Um, it, 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 it's kind of a company. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, if you're looking at, well, I mean, major label promotions results, by the way you frame that, I'm going to consider you mean the major label winning results. Absolutely. Because <laughs> we, we, we win and lose every week. We lose every, you know, and I think sometimes uh, when I talk to, um, when I talk to independents, that's kind of it. They, they're like, hey, you know, tell, how y'all get that number one record? How you get that top 10 record? You know, and it's like, uh, well, the same way I got the one that didn't chart, you, you know, we, we, we work, we roll up our sleeves and, and we work them all and, and you win some and you lose some, it's a combination. But I think for the most part, um, it kind of goes back to uh, when me and Benny hit early on teams. Uh, the main thing that doesn't give independent uh, labels that shot a lot of time is they just don't have a team in you know, it's like, uh, well, hey, man, you know, I want to get my record on the radio. I want to do this. I'll say, well, okay, well, who's doing promotions for you? Uh, well, you know, I went to the station and, uh, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, no, 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 no. You know, and, and, and then it goes to the flip side where people go, well, do I need to go hire a promotions person or, or, or what I need to do? Um, you don't necessarily have to have a promotions person to have a promotions team. If it's you and uh, you know you have two partners, it, it's about dividing up roles and doing the team. You know, uh, if you can bring on some professional assistance in promotions, that's fine. But if you can't, 
the artist has got to do what they do. You have to do what you do as the independent running the label. And, and then you have to put one or two people together, you know, uh, that that's what they do. They go talk to DJs. They go talk to radio stations. They go to clubs. They, um, they travel with the artist and introduce the artist to people and try to get the artist interviews. Uh, the, the number one barrier to me when I see independents that, you know, don't have better promotion is just that there's no work going into it. They just want it to kind of happen. And then if it doesn't happen, it's like, well, I need to plug. I need to be on a label. I need, I need this, but you really don't. You just, you just need somebody sitting there putting in the work for you every day that just focuses. That's their job. Let me call radio stations all day. Let me find out when the music day is for independent artists. Uh, let me find out when they're having showcases. Um, you know, that's, uh, I, I think that's the key is just putting your team together and then putting your plan together and working your plan. Absolutely. Great information. Um, any last thoughts before we get out of here from either one of you? Okay. Wishing you guys the best. Listen, stay diligent. Be motivated. See the finish line. Mr. Hartfield? Yeah, just I uh, want to thank you again for the opportunity to uh, to sit in on the panel today. Uh, same thing, wish uh, all of you guys the best. You know, uh, hey, work hard, ask questions, and make it happen. Awesome. Well, on behalf of SULC and the CLE department, um, thank you guys for taking some time out of your busy lives for us. Uh, you definitely blessed us with so much great information. Um, hopefully the audience uh, found it informative and will uh, you know, take this information and, and do something with it. Um, I'm assuming that both of you guys are on social media. Um, and if it's okay, um, you know, maybe the audience can reach out to you on your various pages and try to network and, you know, see what happens. Absolutely. At BennyPugh.com. Uh, it's B-E-N-N-Y-P-O-U-G-H.com. At BennyPugh.com. And those are also my social handles. Absolutely. Yep. And I'm uh, at Butch. B U T C H Hartfield H A R T F I E L D um, on Gmail. I mean, not Gmail on IG. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much again. Um, stay blessed, and uh, let's get to the finish line. All right. All right.